It is so good to see each and every one of you. Um, you know, as Brother Ariel was praying, you know, we do need to be in prayer for, uh, obviously, the country of Ukraine and those who are there. Um, some of you, uh, there's been a few who've asked. My wife's brother is actually a missionary in the country of Moldova, which is um, kind of pigeonholed in between Ukraine and Romania. And uh, thankfully, they are on the opposite side of the country. They're more on the, the southwestern side of it. But um, we do appreciate your prayers for them as well, as uh, they're definitely dealing with uh, the effects of everything that's going on. And so we definitely need to be bathed in prayer, folks. That's one of our most powerful weapons. And isn't it incredible that even though we may not know a single person over there, if they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, their brothers and sisters, and we can still be praying for them as family, even though we've never met them. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and <clears throat> say our memory verse for the month of February. All together, Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8. All right, this time I invite you to stand. Let's go ahead and sing and worship our great God. I sing the mighty power of God. Reasons. 
Um, but it just seems like they're being kind of bombarded with things that are trying to sidetrack them and keep them away from maybe where God wants them. So he's just asking you to be in prayer for them. And um, they have befriended three Afghan families. They have newly arrived. Um, and so they're praying that they can build a friendship and a rapport and um, just help these immigrants. Um, and then there were already three brothers who were here. They served as interpreters for the U.S. Army. Um, and obviously they've made it here safe to America. But these brothers have elderly parents and extended family who are still in Afghanistan who are not able to leave. And the banks have been shut down there, so they can't even send them any money to help them at all. They are completely stranded and really can't even communicate with them. Um, so that's been very difficult. Um, and these brothers don't know Jesus. Um, so um, they're just praying that as they're working with them and um, been helping interpret for some of the newer families coming, that um, that would be a way for them to reach not only these families, but this, um, these three brothers as well. Um, and then on Monday nights, uh, they, there has been a meeting of church leaders and mission-minded believers studying like a missions 101 class. Um, and Paul was able to go and make a presentation about cross world and so always wants to be praying for more workers, more laborers. Um, and then I know prayer breakfast is this Saturday, but there is also um, here at the chapel in Fort Wayne, there's going to be a packing event for the Project 216, where they um, pack these really nice, convenient meals. Um, the packing event this Saturday will be from 9 to 11, and it's going to be, as always, they do some for local here in Fort Wayne. Um, and then sending it away, it's going to be to floating doctors in Panama. Um, and they, the floating doctors works to deliver health care to the remote coastal communities of Central America. <clears throat> All right, folks, before we get to the um, bulletin, uh, my finger, I had a growth on it and a uh, uh, cyst. Uh, they went in Thursday and outpatient surgery and took that all away and wrapped that all up and said, you're going to be there for a while. And so that's what happened. That, if you want to pray, pray about it, I would appreciate it. Uh, it's amazing when you only have one hand that you can do the things you can't do. But Judy's been helping me, and I appreciate her. All right? Now, for the bulletin, we do have uh, Awana tonight. It is Bring a Friend Night, so please remember that in the youth group also. And it all starts at 6 o'clock. Uh, for the events of the week, um, Monday we do have a deacon's meeting. The, that time is changed to 3.30. I know that all, all my deacons know about that. And then at 6 o'clock is the open gym. Wednesday is Purvey. Please try and make it there, folks. It's it's a good time, and you will be blessed by it also. Thursday, the Golden Group meets at noon. So if you are 55 and older, please try and make that. And we always have a good meal and, and have a good time just fellowshipping. Saturday, for the men's prayer breakfast, right after the prayer breakfast, we want to pull the carpet in the um, foyer. Uh, so anybody that can come for prayer breakfast, We'll come back here, we will rip the carpet up. It shouldn't take us an hour or less, probably. We hope so, okay? All right, and that would just be appreciated if you can do that. Remember the ladies' Bible study that is uh, starting here soon, and the men's Bible study. Both sign-up sheets are back there. If you want to attend either one of them, just get your name there, and we will be looking forward, forward to doing that. Um, I think that's everything that I have. Is there something that I may have missed or something we need to add? Thank you. Let's stand and say, I've got a mansion. <coughs>
great job. Well, praise the Lord. get your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. All right. 1 Corinthians 14. Last week we began into chapter 14, really hearing, you know, Paul's argument that prophecy is superior to the gift of tongues, but it's superior to all gifts, because not all gifts bring edification to the whole body, but prophecy does. And we could rehash the fact that Paul told the Corinthians tongues would cease one day, but even more importantly, the focus is never wants to be about us when it pertains to our spiritual gifts. It doesn't matter what our methods or even our intentions are. The focus of any spiritual gift that the Lord uses through us must be for His glory, for His honor, proclaiming the gospel. So as we get started this morning, let's open in a word of prayer. Father, as we come before you, Lord, I want to thank you so much for the precious gift of your word. Father, for the wisdom 
and instruction that it gives to our lives. Father, I pray that we would cling to it daily. Lord, that we would search it. Lord, as your word says, to search as though we're searching for hidden treasures. And Lord, oh, the treasure of the truth of your word. Father, I pray that as we search for it, that it would only become more and more precious to us because they're your words. Father, they're the very things that as we seek to obey them and follow them, Lord, it makes us more like you. It brings glory and honor to your name. Father, may there be no higher ambition for us as your children. And bless our time now in it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we pick up this week, we find Paul giving another emphatic point. First, he talks about the fact that prophecy is superior, but the second thing that Paul really hammers into, and we're going we're gonna to read verses 6 through 12 here, is that tongues really are not understandable. Tongues are not understandable. Let's read verses 6 through 12 here. Paul says, starting in verse 6, But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking in tongues, what will I profit you unless I speak to you either by way of revelation or of knowledge or of prophecy or of teaching? Yet even lifeless things, either flute or harp in producing a sound, if they do not produce a distinction in the tones, how will it be known what is played on the flute or on the harp? For if the bugle produces an indistinct sound, who will prepare himself for battle? So also you, unless you utter by the tongue speech that is clear, how will, it be, how will it be known what is spoken? For you'll be speaking into the air. There are perhaps a great many kinds of languages in the world, and no kind is without meaning. If then I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be to the one who speaks a barbarian, and the one who speaks will be a barbarian to me. So also you, since you're zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. Technology has brought some very useful and some very good upgrades to our way of life. Uh, but newer isn't always better. I personally enjoy some of those advances, but if I'm going to be honest, there are times I can be very poor at properly using those advances, especially in the area of communication. If I don't respond right away, I find, especially to a phone call or a text, I tend to forget, and thus I fail to communicate effectively. One major problem with communication when you're using text or emails is the inability that we have to then read somebody's body language or hear their tone of voice. See, if I'm in person, I can hear the words that they're saying and there's, it gives further definition to what's being said. Or I can even see the demeanor in which you're standing, whether you're angry with me or happy with me. It's amazing. There's so much more in our communication than just the words. And yet, it never ceases to amaze me that when people misread or mis misunderstand those messages, even when they're handwritten letters or notes, I don't know about you, but if there's one thing I do not like on my phone, it's autocorrect. How many of you have ever typed a message and then hit send before reading it thoroughly and then it was like, oh, what's up? that's not what I meant to say. <laughs> in fact, it was about a month ago, uh, someone had texted me that they had tested positive for COVID. Well, but they weren't having any symptoms. So my initial response through text was at least in my head, I was thinking, well, well, praise the Lord, you haven't had any symptoms, you know, and I said, we'll be praying that you have no symptoms. Autocorrect decided I didn't need the word no. So it came out, I'll pray that you have symptoms. And it was just like, ah. I quickly tried to change the, or you do the little reply message where you put the asterisk and you put the word wrong in bold. I didn't mean to say that. Well, isn't it true, though, sometimes there are simple messages that can even be easily misunderstood or received in person incorrectly? Sometimes people mishear or misunderstood what you were saying. Now, I've had that happen even when I've preached before. Somebody's come up to me and like, uh, Pastor, you said this, or is that what you meant? And then it gives me an opportunity, therefore, immediately in person to correct the issue or explain what I said so that they do understand it. But... 
having said all that, if even our common forms of or communication can be misconstrued, how much more difficult is it to communicate something using unknown words or unknown forms of communication? You know, I, I remember, and, and I think it's a very talented thing when you have somebody who knows sign language well. I've been in many church services where they've interpreted for deaf people in their church. But I got to be honest with you, and when I was sitting in college, because they did that a lot when we were in college, and whenever I sat in that section by where they would, would have several of the deaf people sit and they'd have an interpreter there, someone doing sign language, I'd watch them from time to time, but I didn't get a thing out of that sign language. Why? Because I don't know sign language. I mean, to me, it's no different than watching, you know, your first baseman give the signs, whether they're steal or not. It's just their motions, but I don't understand what they mean. Now, to the person who understands it and, and knows it, those words have great meaning. But what Paul here is saying in regard to the fact that in verse 6, there are some things that no matter if they have meaning or not, if you don't understand them, then they're pointless. They do you no good. Brethren, if I come to you speaking in tongues, what will I profit you, he says, unless I speak to you either by way of revelation or of knowledge or of prophecy or of teaching? To strengthen the point, he's using himself as an illustration. He says, if I come to you, even if I, an apostle, is the one speaking in tongues, and hear the word that, and, and I need to give a disclaimer too, because the word that he's using here for tongues in the Greek, it's not talking about some gibberish. It's not talking about some uh, crazy spewings that come out of your mouth. It's talking about speaking in another language that you don't speak. That's the word he's using there. It gives, he says, no profit if there's no interpretation. Now, does anybody in here speak Spanish? Nobody? Wow. <laughs> I could have somebody come up here and reread our text for this morning in Spanish. And as long as they speak it fluently and understand it, is there any less meaning in those verses, even though they're speaking it in a different language? Do they still carry the same meaning, whether they're spoken in English or Spanish or Russian, whatever? You agree with me? But does it do us any good if we don't understand those words? I mean, we might be able to pick out some words here and there. You know, I, we had um, at the funeral for Heidi's mom, her and her sisters had requested to have Amazing Grace played, but they wanted it played in German because that was her mom's primary language. Why, as I sat there and I was listening to it, you know, I could pick out some words and to a certain degree, there is a little bit uh, of beauty that comes from it because I know what the words are in English. But having said that, there were definitely a couple of verses that I wasn't sure what she was saying. I wasn't sure which verse she was singing because she didn't sing all the verses. Now, what Paul's saying here is the message if it's truly being used to edify the church and it's going to be of any benefit to you, it has to be either by way of revelation, by knowledge, which is uh, revelation and knowledge are referring to the, the internal, and prophecy or teaching, which is the external, but they're to be made understandable to the ones who are listening. Any message is useless if it can't be properly comprehended, correct? You know, if I text you a message with a whole bunch of letters and numbers jabbered together, you probably look at me and, you know, pastor was just you know, butt dialed me or something with his, with his phone. But then if I come back to you, it's like, did you get my message? And then you're going to be like, well, what in the world is that supposed to mean? Well, until I come and explain, well, it, it's this, this, and this. Then you're going to look at me as like, how was I supposed to understand that? Communication, if it's to be effective, especially when we're talking about the preaching and proclaiming of God's word, if you can't understand it, it's of no benefit. It makes me think, of my high school trig class. The teacher that we had um, was a guy that had started coming to our church and he actually taught at DeVry, um, which was a college there in Chicago. And the guy was, I mean, like on genius level. Now, for that trig class, there were only three of us in the class. 
And the other two students that were in that class aside from me, the three of us made up probably the best math students in the entire high school. And so they wanted to have something extra for us. So they, brought the, they asked this guy who had been coming to our church if he'd come and teach trig class once a week. As brilliant as he was, and even as smart as the, the three of us were in, in relationship to math, this guy spoke on another language. Because half the time he'd come in and he would teach something and it was just like the three of us would look at each other and we're like, you know, we know math pretty well, but I have no clue what he just said. He was talking on another level. Now, the information he had was extremely valuable, but it never benefited me because I had no clue what he was talking about. He wasn't capable of explaining it in a way where I was able to understand it. So therefore it became useless to me. It wasn't doing me any good. And what Paul is stressing to the Corinthians here is that the private use of this gift of tongues is excluded because it's useless. It's not bringing edification to the church. It's incredible that some believers put such a premium on unintelligible utterances that no one, including the speaker, can even attempt to understand. In some instances in normal language, what is claimed to be an interpretation has been proved to have no relationship with what is actually being spoken. Therefore, how much more chaotic and confusing is it to use a language that no one else speaks? People who've tested <coughs> an interpreter by speaking in Hebrew or another language known to them but unknown by the interpreter have had their words translated into messages that had absolutely no correspondence to what was spoken. Now, I'll give you a simple illustration to those who actually can communicate with sign language. That's a, that's a very precious and valuable gift, especially to those who can't hear anything auditory at all. But having said that, there have definitely been some people who thought they knew what they were saying and didn't know it so well. And in one case, I know of an individual who thought she was translating it as well like she did it during the song service. Now, it is well with my soul is probably one of my favorite hymns. But I came to find out that the words that she was actually translating is, it's all good with God and me. There's something significantly missing in that message, especially from what the songwriter originally wrote with those words. Therefore, it's almost saddening because it's though we're missing and we're leaving out very, very key or important things. Like some of the Corinthians, such abusers of the gift of tongues, were not only putting self-glorification above the edification of the church, but they were even adding deception to the abuse. Paul goes on to say, even lifeless things, so it's like a flute or a harp are expected to make sensible sounds unless you put them in the hands of someone who doesn't know how to play them. I'm pretty sure that if I were to bring a flute up here, at least one person in the room I probably would offend the most would be, with, be Miss Brenda. Why? Because whatever notes or sounds that I might produce from that flute would be nothing from what someone who's able to play it can produce. So therefore, you know, rhythm, structure, harmony, and other such orderly qualities, they take a group of notes and transform them into music instead of just mere noise. For music to be intelligible in its own way, it must make musical sense. Every note, every chord, every phrase has a musical purpose in order to communicate joy, or sadness, or peace, or strife, whatever the composer intends. And Paul continues by saying, if they don't produce a distinction in the tones, how will it be known what is played on the flute or the harp? Without variation, without order, even the distinction of notes, a musical instrument in the hands of someone who doesn't know how to play it only makes noise. I mean, I could ask, <laughs> I still remember... And I, and, and I hope this doesn't embarrass him at all, but I remember talking with, with Rich when we first came here. And I was just like, you know, uh, Miss Jeannie and Missy both play uh, very beautifully on these instruments. And, and even uh, his daughter Lori plays other instruments very well too. And I said, well, man, what do you play? And he looked at me with a smile. He's like, I play the radio. <laughs> 
I mean, chances are, if he were to come up here and we put him at the piano, he could try to bang some notes, but that doesn't necessarily mean that music would produce, does it? But now if we ask one of these ladies to come up here and play a song, both of them could sit down there <laughs> with or without the music and probably play some beautiful music. But it would be in such a way that we'd be able to understand it. If I came up here to the piano and I just took my hand and did this several times, now, now here's the, I'm going to use it for sake of illustration. Okay, now, whether you realize it or not, I just played a song in my head. Anybody have a guess as to what song that was? Nobody? It wasn't as well with my soul. I just played Amazing Grace. You guys didn't hear it? I heard it in my head. <clears throat> That's what Paul's trying to say here. If musical instruments don't produce a distinction in the, in the tones, how will it be known what is played? Changing the figure somewhat, Paul points out that if a bugle produces an indistinct sound, basically the kind of sound I would make on it if I tried to play it, who will prepare himself for battle? See, hearing a bugle means nothing to a soldier if a definite military call is not being played. Mere bugle notes are meaningless, even if played by an official bugler on the best instrument available. A soldier gets no message from a bunch of random notes. He only gets ready when he hears that call to arms or charge or when other such calls are played on it. Now, in the same way, we cannot communicate Christian truth through meaningless sounds. Paul says, unless you utter by the tongue speech that is clear. How will it be known what is spoken? For you'll be speaking into the air. See, the Corinthians had become so carnally self-centered that they didn't even care about the fact that nobody was actually being communicated to. All they cared about was, look at me, look what I can do. You look like a fool. They were so interested in impressing others but they didn't even care whether something was truly being communicated, much less they didn't even care that nobody was being edified within the body. Paul compares those individuals to these musical instruments that are blown into by someone who's not an or a musician, by someone who plays so poorly that what comes out is unrecognizable. And for such incompetence produced by pride and lovelessness, just what Paul spent chapter 13 going over, this assembly at Corinth was quite simply confused, disorderly, and unproductive. As Paul goes on in verse 10, he continues to hammer away at the same point. He says, there are perhaps a great many kind of language, or kinds of languages in the world, and no kind is without meaning. He simply states the obvious. A language without meaning are, is pointless. A language meaning in itself is not really a language. It is meaning that transforms the words into language. He goes on by saying, The great many kinds of language in the world all sound differently, but each has a single common purpose, to communicate, to transmit meaning among those who speak it. I mean, not only must a legitimate language be used in order to communicate, but both the speaker and the hearer must understand it. By definition, communication must be two-sided. Otherwise, as Paul says, I shall be to the one who speaks a barbarian, and the one who speaks will be a barbarian to me. Now that word barbarian was a common way to address someone who acted or spoke or communicated differently. Someone who looked different. I, if I were to bring in some friends I have from college, and they could come up here and preach a much more powerful, maybe they, they may be a much better orator and illustrator than I could even compare to, but if they came up here today and preached the message to you in an unknown language, if they came up here and preached in Tagalog, it would do none of you good. Now to a Filipino who speaks that dialect, the words that they're speaking have the saving power of the gospel, but if we don't understand them, what good is it? Now, if we had somebody come up here and interpret it, 
Well, then that changes things. We might be able to understand, but even then, who are you going to benefit from more? Hey, has anybody in here ever been to a service where there actually was somebody translating what the speaker was saying into English for the, you guys, the listeners? Being honest, if you were someone who sat in that message before, do you think you got more out of that message? Or if that same message had been preached in just English, you would have gotten more. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, the message preached all in English would have done me a whole lot better. Not because the, the, the message has changed, but let's face it, if I'm constantly hearing words spoken in a different language and then translated to English, and then I got to listen more to this other language and wait for them to be interpreted back and forth, it can become a little confusing. Now it becomes necessary at times, you know. Man, would the day ever come that, that we had some foreign missionaries that were able to come visit our church and share some things. And you know, I always find it neat when they share things with us in a different language and then interpret it for us. I think those things are wonderful that those individuals have spent time studying other languages so that they could communicate and edify other people around the world. I think it's a wonderful thing. But let's be honest. If I had gotten up this morning and began preaching in Chinese and never uttered a word of English or interpreted it, you all would have either left by now or at least tried to stop me and plead with me to speak some English. You know, we mentioned last week the Tower of Babel. Can you imagine standing next to someone and then all of a sudden, hey, hand me that hammer. And then in response, you got, just hand me the hammer. The problem is, that same weird noise that you just heard from them, you speak it back and they're hearing some other weird noise back to you. I, <laughs> That's exactly what probably led to many shouting matches the day the Lord confused the languages. But why did he do it? He wanted the people weren't obeying. They weren't following his command. To a person who does not know a language, it often sounds as if the words are all alike and meaningless. To most Greeks of Paul's day, anyone who didn't speak Greek was referred to as a barbarian. Because to them... Their language was unintelligible. As he goes on in verse 12, If therefore even true tongues are meaningless without interpretation, Paul says, How much more meaningless is that pagan-like gibberish that's a counterfeit of the true thing? He says, Since you're zealous of spiritual gifts, seek, that means search for, pursue, to abound for the edification of the church. In other words, if you're so eager to minister spiritual gifts, minister them in the way that God intended for the benefit of the church. In particular, for the church's edification. And remember, what does that word edify mean? It means to build up. Hopefully, every Sunday you come and you sit under the preaching of God's word, hopefully when you leave, you've either been convicted of some things in your life that aren't what they're supposed to be, or you've been convicted about some things that need to be in your life that aren't there. Either way, hopefully there's been some edification. If there's not, and I've said it before, there's either two things that are happening if you're not being edified when you come and sit under preaching. Either A, it's not real preaching of God's word and God's truth is not the focus of what's needing to be proclaimed to the crowd, or you're not listening. I'm not going to pretend for one second that I even come close to being one of the best preachers. I know there's men who are far more gifted with their speaking abilities. There's men who are far more gifted with their knowledge and studying skills of God's Word. One thing that I've asked the Lord for strength to do, and it's a promise that I've asked Him to allow me to keep to you as this church, is that my words will not be the ones that come forth from this pulpit. That it would be His. Because if you come to hear my words, you've wasted your time. I'm nobody. But man, the one that my heart desires to preach about is everything. And what his word says ought to be the things that matter the most to us. Again, coming back to what Paul is saying here, the clear word is that this gift of speaking is for public not private use and benefit. The present tense of that word, seek, indicates that it's to be continuous, a daily action. The purpose of the gift of tongues, just as the purpose of all languages, was to 
communicate. Although it was a miraculous sign gift, it was also a communicative gift. From its first occurrence at Pentecost, the Lord intended it to be a means of communication. The very uh, miracle of tongues at Pentecost was in fact that everyone present, though many different countries were present, they all heard the apostles speak in his own language. That was always characteristic of genuine tongue speaking. The Pentecost tongues and every true manifestation of it after that time until their cessation when they ceased were understandable either directly as in Acts 2 or through an interpreter as Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 14 here. God didn't give two kinds of tongues, one intelligible and the other unintelligible. The Bible speaks of only one gift whose characteristic, <coughs> excuse me, characteristics and purpose never changed. Of course, that leads us into our last point. One thing that is often missing when things don't make sense is common sense. You know, I used to say, common sense evades us all from time to time, but from some people it just plain runs away. I will say, while I kind of like that one because it makes you think a little bit, our, our dear sister Leanne, and not to really get too sidetracked with her, but you know, for those of you who don't know her, um, she is a dear sister, and, and I would ask you to pray for her. She's been battling a lot of health issues, and um, every time she's gone to a different doctor or a different hospital, they've all come to the same conclusion. They don't know what's wrong, and they don't know how to help her. But that woman still has one of the most sweetest dispositions you'll ever find. Now, having said that, I brought her up because she has given me one of my best lines now when it comes to common sense, and it's not my favorite to use. Common sense is just like deodorant. The people who need it the most don't use it. Might be some teenagers that are what? Just kidding. Tongues just doesn't make sense. Thus Paul closes with the point that tongues are emotional. They're not rational. Let's read verses 13 through 19 in our text here. Paul starts in verse 13. Therefore, let one who speaks in a tongue or another language pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What is the outcome then? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the mind also. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the mind also. Otherwise, if you bless in the spirit only, how will the one who fills the place of the ungifted say the amen at your giving of thanks since he doesn't know what you're saying? For you are giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not edified. I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. However, in the church, I, I desire to speak five words with my mind so that I may instruct others also rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. Let me start with this simple statement regarding emotions. Are emotions God-given? Yes or no? You know the best example of that being true? It's the shortest verse in the Bible. John eleven thirty five. 35. Jesus what? He wept. It doesn't say Jesus cried. It doesn't say Jesus just shed a few tears. It says he wept. That's that like ugly crying. Weeping is so much more than crying. And for sake of time, the Bible clearly teaches that emotions come from the Lord. He demonstrated them while he was here, even when he walked in the flesh. But we make much more out of our emotions than we should sometimes, especially in spiritually related manners. The simple statement that I want you to keep in mind as we continue on this last point here is, how quickly can emotions change? Now, most of you would agree with me, emotions can, can change on the drop of a dime. Therefore, if you make emotionally based decisions all the time, you can irrationally make the wrong choice the majority of the time. Now, I don't know about you, but I love the, the privilege of sharing the wonderful truths and blessings that I get from the Lord. I, as many people as I can share them with. 
Hopefully, all of us are like this, that as we continue to spend time in God's Word on a daily basis, every time we learn something new, it becomes precious. And we don't go run to tell our brother or sister in Christ because, Haha, look, I've been studying my Bible and here's my proof. No, it's like, man, have you ever seen this before? And they may say yes, but then your response is, man, isn't that great? Isn't that wonderful? When's the last time you've spent time talking to somebody else outside of church about what you've learned from your own personal devotions and daily walk with the Lord? And if your answer is, I'm, I don't remember, do something about it. You know, I was talking with my brother this past week. And he had asked me, or he sent me a text that was kind of random. But he says, you know, is James still your favorite book of the Bible? And I said, yeah. And he says, why? And it wasn't like he was trying, he was just like, what is your reason? What, what makes that book so precious? Because it's one of the first books of the Bible that I think I truly began to study and understand the best. And the more and more I studied it, especially some of those, those verses that James talks about that sometimes they're, they're presented one way, but if you don't dig deeper, you're, mean, you're missing a whole bunch. And when you start digging in and you get the true meaning that we find in God's Word, in any passage, it becomes more precious. I'll be honest with you. After having preached through the book of 1 John and almost having finished preaching through the book of 1 Corinthians here, as difficult as some of the topics have been in 1 Corinthians, this book's a lot more precious to me than it was three or four years ago. The message of it hasn't changed, but the more I've come to know it, the more precious it's become to me. You know, like so many other aspects of many modern day churches, there's this strong, or this strong sense to have everyone who attends feel this emotional good drive that's going to keep coming them back for a feel-good experience. Now, I'm not going to lie. It's our hope and desire that every time somebody walks through these doors, that they do feel welcomed and loved. Why? Because hopefully we realize how much we've been loved by the Lord. And we want to show that to anyone we possibly can. Hopefully God will continue to cultivate that mindset here within our church that we're a body of believers that love each other. But having said that, if all we're doing is to have people come in so that we can entertain them, we're wasting our time. You know, that strong sense, that trying to appease people's emotions, if that's the goal, the Lord's not being pleased, that's not edification. Of course, you have churches, though, that are on the opposite side of the spectrum that try to almost run away from and they fear anything that contains emotions. Like, no, we can't have emotions. We just have to sit here and sing our hymns like this. Folks, it, and I'm not saying we do this a lot, but I, I, I plead with you. When we sing and worship the Lord, sing out and think about the words that you're singing. Let that joy show on your face. There's nothing more conflicting than singing something like, There is joy in serving Jesus. Yeah, you don't look very joyful when you're singing that sometimes. There ought to be great joy. There, I mean, if anything, there ought to be some emotion within our worship service that we're blessed and touched by what the Lord has done for us. There ought to be times when we hear, whether it's a verse from one of the songs that we sing, or when someone gets up here and sings a special, that, that it really does touch and bless our heart. But hopefully our prayer and desire is that that's only preparing and setting our heart for the truth that's going to come from God's Word later in that service. Because this, even though it is filled with emotions, this is absolute truth. This doesn't change, praise the Lord. In verse 13, in this section, Paul continues to teach about counterfeit tongues and therefore continues to speak somewhat sarcastically. Uh, I think it's the Apostle Paul who we, we can somewhat joke and say he saw sarcasm as one of the other fruits of the Spirit. Or fruit of the Spirit, but it's not. I'm just teasing. But in this section, 
He's got this sarcastic tone to his voice. And it's indicated in the first place, first place by the fact that he uses the singular form of the word tongue, which was a, commonly his way of referring to the false gift, except for verse 27, where, he, where the reference is to one uh, man speaking on one occasion. But in the second place, what he says here doesn't, for the most part, apply to the true gift of tongues. If Paul weren't speaking sarcastically of counterfeited uh, gifts here, he'd be asking the Corinthians to seek the true gift of interpretation. But he's already made it clear that the Holy Spirit sovereignly distributes gifts, as, tw as chapter 12, verse 11 says, individually just as he wills. Gifts are not to be sought by us, we're simply to accept them and seek to use them for God's glory. So Paul sarcastically reproaches carnal believers for their immaturity, saying, in effect, while you're jabbering away in your ununderstandable, pseudo-false tongues, you could at least ask God to give you some means of making them beneficial to the church. As you now exercise them, they're both pagan and they're pointless. <coughs> in verse 14, in the pagan rites, that a lot of these Corinthian believers had come out of and things that they were so familiar with, speaking in ecstatic utterances was considered their way of communing with the gods, spirit to spirit. And their experience was intended to bypass their mind and normal understanding. As we have already commented on, the mysteries of false religions are meant to remain mis mysterious. Paul here it may have used the word pneuma, which can be translated spirit, wind, or breath, in the sense of breath. If so, he was saying, if I pray in a self-manufactured tongue, my breath prays, but my mind is unfruitful. It certainly seems impossible that the spirit that he uses here refers to the Holy Spirit as some would believe. His spirit being manifested through our spirits is what they're in, in, in saying, but that's not the Holy Spirit that Paul is referring to here. Talking about the inner spirit of man. All Christians are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Amen? So if Paul was speaking of the Holy Spirit in relation to my spirit, then grammatically and theologically he was also speaking of the Holy Spirit in relation to my mind when he said it. The Holy Spirit could not be praying through a person while bypassing his mind. And he certainly wasn't saying that the mind of the Holy Spirit sometimes can be unfruitful. The apostle has to be speaking entirely of himself and, and hypothetically. He says, even though if I am an apostle were to speak gibberish that many of you speak, my mind would have no part in it. I would only be making wind or blowing air. What I would say would be as empty and mindless as the ecstasies that you used to witness in your pagan temples. So then Paul kind of twisted even further. He says, what is the outcome then? What is the outcome of all this stuff? The answer is that there is no place for mindless, ecstatic prayer. Praying and singing with the Spirit must be accompanied by praying and singing with the mind also. It's obvious that edification cannot exist apart from the mind. Spirituality is, uh, involves more than the mind, but it never excludes the mind. In Scripture, and certainly in the writings of Paul, no premium is placed on ignorance. Quoting from Deuteronomy 6.5, Jesus reinforced that Old Testament command that we should love the, God, the Lord our God with all our hearts, with all our soul, and with all our mind. Praying or singing in tongues doesn't serve a purpose. And Paul wouldn't do it. He says, otherwise, if you bless in the Spirit only, how will the one who fills the place of the ungifted say the amen at your giving of thanks, since he doesn't know what you're saying? Now, it's not my, it's not my intention to put down and make fun of those who believe in it. My only intention here is let's look at what the Word of God is saying. Let's base everything we believe on this book, not on our opinions, not on our experiences, period. But having said that, I read this verse and it made me think of something that we saw in college. I believe it was one of the classes I took, it was church in the 20th century. And they were showing us different types of churches, teaching us what other different denominations believed. But they brought up, and, and our teacher showed a class in video, or, or, or a video in class one day, and it was of this preacher who was going on speaking in tongues. It felt almost like you were watching a modern day 
Abbott and Costello kind of scene because they had this other guy who was just standing over on the stage and, you know, not looking professional. He's just, you know, kind of standing like, <laughs> just like, like he's all comfortable up there. And then all of a sudden, the, I mean, and the whole time the preacher is going on and he's just talking, speaking in tongues, but it's all this nonsense gibberish. And then he's like, <laughs> and he looks over at the guy and the guy's just like, <laughs> starts laughing. And that was the cue to the audience. He just told a joke in tongues. But they had to be cued. Look at what he's saying here. Otherwise, if you bless in the Spirit only, how will the one who fills the place of the ungifted say the amen? How is somebody going to know the proper place to say amen in a service if they don't know the word you're speaking? Ungifted. That word for ungifted that he uses, I think is better translation, translated in its usual sense of being ignorant, unlearned, or, or unskilled. A person who is ignorant of a language being spoken can't possibly understand uh, what he's hearing. In a worship service, for example, he, he can't possibly know when to say the amen at your giving of thanks. Prayers or songs of thanks could not include anyone else if they're given in unintelligible sounds. Now, does anybody know what the word amen means? So let it be. It's, it's a word of in agreement and encouragement. And it was commonly used by worshipers in the synagogue. And the practice carried over into many early Christian churches. And in fact, we, we practice it even today. A person, though, cannot know to say amen if they don't know what's being said. As he goes on in verse 17, the person speaking in a tongue may feel he is giving thanks well enough, but no one else will know what is being said. The other man is not edified, as he should be when the gift is ministered properly. Lest the Corinthians, after reading this, think he no longer recognized the true gift of tongues, Paul says, I thank God. I speak in tongues more than you all. And he makes it clear that he wasn't condemning the true gift or enviously criticizing a gift that he didn't himself possess. Here he's using the plural word for tongues. He's no longer speaking hypothetically and he's no longer speaking of a counterfeited gift. Paul had had more experience than any of the Corinthians. You all, he says, in speaking in tongues. Though we don't have a single record of a specific instance. He knew what the proper use of the true gift involved and what it didn't involve. We can be sure that he did not use the gift in any perverted way or for personal gratification. He may have used it just the same way that it was used at Pentecost to bring a supernatural message to those God wanted to reach and as a miraculous sign verifying the gospel and his apostolic authority. Yet he considered the gift so low in value as compared to his other gifts and ministries that in none of his writings does he mention a specific use of it by him or any other believer. The gift of languages had a proper place for a prescribed time as a miraculous confirming sign to unbelievers with an accompanying purpose of edification through interpretation. He said, however, in the church, I desire to speak five words with my mind that I might instruct others also rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. Again, referring to that pagan gibberish. He emphasizes that an uncountable number of sounds in unintelligible tones has no place in the church and it's useless. Five understandable words are to be desired more. The apostle wasn't speaking of an exact mathematical ratio, by the way, either. The word for 10,000 comes from the Greek word murioi. It's the word we get myriad from. And that was the largest number that the Greeks had a specific word for to determine the highest number that they could think of in a spoken word. It's the term from which, you know, when translated myriad, the book of Revelation talks about myriads of myriads and then thousands of thousands. It's to indicate a completely immeasurable figure. Now, just out of curiosity, does anybody know what that word is in English for the highest number that we can think of? Most of you use it on a regular basis. It's a popular search engine. It's Google. Google is a number, the number one with a million zeros behind it. Now, I don't know about you, but okay, I can, I can process millions, then billions, then trillions, then quadrillions, and we could probably even get to, you know, pentillions, sextillions, septillions, octillions. Would it be nonillions? After that, I, I give up. And even that, I haven't even gotten to 30 zeros yet. 
So a number with a million zeros, <laughs> our, brain, our brain just can't even fathom how big that would be. And yet, the purpose is, it doesn't matter if you could use billions or a Google's worth of sounds. Five words spoken so that the listener can hear it and be edified by it are far more profitable. Paul knew that the gift of tongues was going to cease probably within a few years of when he was writing them. He wasn't giving instructions here in chapter 14 for governing t church, or tongues in the church today. He wasn't even giving instructions to the Corinthian believers there because he was speaking of counterfeit tongues which were based in their self-centered emotionalism and it didn't originate from the Holy Spirit. He was giving them, as well as believers of all ages, warning against using self-serving, worldly, carnal, ineffective, and God-dishonoring substitutes for the true spiritual gifts that God has ordained to be ministered in the power and in the fruit of His Spirit for the blessing and edification of the church. I hope, I hope there's no one here today that would argue these things. Because I'll tell you, these aren't my opinions, this is God's Word. Folks, I'm not concerned that we have some strong base of people or that tongues is a problem that's developing here within our church. And it was not my purpose to hammer on this topic so much lately. But as I've told you, I'm committed to preaching God's Word one verse at a time, and we just happen to be in the passage of Scripture that talks about it the most. So my question to you is, if this isn't an issue within our church, and perhaps this has been more of an informational type of message, what's the application for us? I would humbly say to you that we are to be on guard, not just against trying to use a gift that has ceased, we ought to be on guard with our motives uh, uh, of service. What is our intention for serving the Lord? Is our intention to try to serve the Lord how I see best? Or is our heart truly saying, Lord, I, I just want to serve you? Whatever means you want to use me to accomplish your will, I'm humbly honored. I had some added some things in here that I wanted to share with you this morning, but for sake of time, I'm going to stop at this. But, folks, we just had. Our business meeting a couple weeks ago. It is my hope and prayer that for whatever time the Lord may have left for us, I do believe the rapture is going to happen soon. I do, and I, I hope it does. Um, but until it does, we need to be faithful about serving Him. Amen? That being said, this church can't function on just a few doing it. Every single one of you are valuable and necessary to the Lord accomplishing His will through this church. Now yeah, if it's His will to do it through just one or two people, He could because He's God. He's all powerful that way. But there is great joy that comes from serving Him. And I hope and pray that in this coming year that He will use each and every one of us to accomplish some great things. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we come before you today, Father, I thank you for the, the heartbeat that I do believe is present here. Father, a heartbeat to serve you your way so that you get all the glory. Yet, Father, I pray that you will continue Lord, to protect us. Protect us from Satan's attacks. Lord, protect us from ourselves at times. Lord, that you would use us in a great and mighty way. Father, that each of us would always have a desire to serve you. Lord, that so you might use us to edify one another. Lord, to manifest your love both to the unbeliever and the believer alike. Father, may we be that light and that salt to a lost world, and may we be that comfort 
an exhortation to our brothers and sisters around us. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we close this morning, hopefully a familiar song to you, but seek ye first. If there's one application that we can get from a passage like this, let's not worry about what we want to do to serve the Lord. Let's be first concerned with first, what does He want? And seek it wholeheartedly. Let's sing. And will you stand with me as we sing? Seek ye. Jesus' name. Amen.